small spoilers ahead for Observer, and a warning, this video contains flashing lights. In the time of your life live, so that in that good time there shall be no ugliness or death for yourself or for any life your life touches. Seek goodness everywhere, and when it is found, bring it out of its hiding place and let it be free and unashamed. Place in matter and in flesh the least of the values, for these are things that hold death and must pass away. Discover in all things that which shines and is beyond corruption. Encourage virtue in whatever heart it may have been driven into secrecy and sorrow by the shame and terror of the world. Ignore the obvious, for it is unworthy of the clear eye and kindly heart." This is a quote by William Sarayan, an American-Armenian author born in California in 1908. It plays during Observer, and for the life of me, I could never figure out why. I asked on Twitter, what do you think this quote is trying to say? And I got a lot of responses. A verbose live, laugh, love. A make the most of the time you're given. Focus on what's on the inside. Build a legacy of goodness. Be positive and forgiving. Haters gonna hate etc. A very inoffensive message all in all. I've now played Observer three times through and I can say without a shadow of a doubt this quote makes very little sense within the context of the game, especially so up front and centre. It's too vague to take anything specific about the game from. It's an unusual choice, whether it's an ironic message from the developer, some inside joke or some vague explanation of the meaning of the story that I just couldn't divine. I don't know. So when I say I approached Observer with a grain of salt at the ready, you can believe it was there well before I ever had to press a button. I've spent a lot of time and energy on this channel deconstructing Bloober's work. Looking at the overall pattern, there is a clearly defined habit of ignorance surrounding themes like suicide and self-harm, trauma, sexual assault. I discuss it more thoroughly in my videos on the medium and the Blair Witch specifically, which I've linked in the description if you want to take a look, but especially in the medium, Bloober has a difficult track record of raising enormous societal issues, developing them loosely over the course of a game, and then rushing an ending wherein these issues are solved, neatly wrapped up in a quick bow and filed under complete. Their examinations of these themes are at best well-intentioned and at worst insulting, and the criticism they face is well-deserved and generally fair. If you can't write a story about mental health properly, don't bother, and stop presenting death by suicide as the only solution for people who the game's characterise as too broken to fix, so on and so forth. The discourse about Bloober's handling of mental health is long established. But whenever I discuss Bloober and their habit of putting out shit games, I always make a point to mention the one exception, the one bastion of quality, arguably Bloober's best piece of work because I do think it deserves to be recognised. Observer. Ironic that Bloober's best piece of work is their littlest stone, but that's how things go sometimes. And before we discuss it, a word from our sponsor. My biggest issue with taking care of my daily health and making sure I get all the nutrition that I need is that everything I want is so rarely ever in the same package. I have all sorts of vitamin pills, sachets, dissolvables, but they are super inefficient, especially when visiting friends and family, so I just kind of leave them out and it means I miss out on my daily nutrition. Until I found AG1. And now it just takes one minute, and my AG1 minute is so well ingrained in my morning routine that it's the same as getting my coffee and I often make them side by side and have them together. Making it so easy to improve my lifestyle in these small and easy ways. AG1 tastes nostalgically sweet. It reminds me of these sweets that I really liked from back when I was a kid, but it's such a good way to start my morning routine with like this nostalgic memory of this sweet that I used to love. And while I'm reminiscing on like year six discos and pizza parties, AG1 also helps me in the now. You know, balancing my full-time job, going to the gym, YouTube, social life. It can be really hard and often I just feel fatigued and like drained. However, I've been drinking AG1 for a good few weeks every day and I have noticed an incredible change in my energy levels. Which probably has a whole lot to do with like the wheatgrass, manganese, zinc, vitamins, uh, K2, B5, B12 and a whole host of other ingredients. I could not name you all of them. So what are you waiting for? Click the link in the description box or my pinned comment to get a one year supply of immune boosting vitamin D3 K2 and five travel packs for free with your first purchase of AG1. Making your daily health routine the easiest thing you will ever do. Now, back to the video. Observer cropped up very early in Bloober's timeline, released one year after Layers of Fear, a game I've played but can't really be that arsed to discuss, at least at the moment. Observer released in 2017 and didn't really make waves. Of their big four games, those being Layers of Fear, Observer, The Medium and The Blair Witch, I feel it's definitely the least well known and that is a shame. Observer was written by Anjay Mojak, the sole writer of Layers of Fear, my friend told me how to pronounce that name, I'm sorry if I got it wrong. The writing team saw various staffing changes throughout Bloober's lifetime, but Anjay's presence was consistent. 
And honestly, I have no idea whether or not Observer was just narrative lightning in a bottle for Andre, whether he like wiped his ass one day and pulled his hand back to see the script of this game on the paper divined by some miracle, especially since Layers of Fear came before Observer and faced a lot of the same criticism that the medium came with after Observer. So it's hard to tell if Observer was this like focused intentional effort written by somebody with like just this honest idea of a story that they wanted wanted to tell, or whether or not it was just this complete accident that just happened. And as you can tell, like, I'm cynical about this studio, I'm really cynical about Bloober. Their ability to tell, like, good, coherent stories is in question after a track record of crap. So I want you to keep that in mind when I tell you that Observer is brilliant. Not only narratively, the story is really interesting, but through world building, character design, and the jumble of metaphors to hack through, with a machete like the last living shirtless marine in a predator movie. And this game features a lot of metaphor. There's just so much of all sorts of figurative language in Observer. Most of it is biblical, but there's a lot that can be attributed to classic novels like Frankenstein and the picture of Dorian Gray. I guarantee that anyone who plays this game can find something which makes greater sense to them than just a surface level story. And in that discovery, you find something profound, something that affects you personally. It makes the game that much more memorable. Some people prefer their media all tight and tucked, with one or two particularly strong themes and a splattering of smaller ones. An inability to refine a story's themes is often seen as a weakness, a disoriented jumble. I understand, the game is loaded with allegory, often to the point of confusion. Some allegories overlap confusingly. Some of them follow the allegory 80% of the Way and then just drop it, as if the allegory evolved in a way you completely missed or if it's just half-baked. Some allegories just don't really make that much sense when you look at them closely, some don't even seem like they were implemented intentionally. But I like the way the game tried to approach a ton of different things, I don't think it was neat and tidy or even that brilliant, but Observer tried to tell a story that would be fun and engaging on a surface level and to pick apart, and in that it succeeded, I thought it was great. And the main character doesn't nobly take their own life at the end, I know right? Mental. So let's give this game the attention it's worth. Let's discuss the story, what works and what doesn't, and then spend some time looking at some of the primary allegories in this game, and unpack what it is about Observer that is just so worth your time. Before we begin, please drop a like, comment, subscribe to this video if you enjoy it. I cover tons of stuff on my channel, games, TV, movies, be those like basic reviews or more in-depth analysis like we're gonna go into today. So if that sounds like your jam, make sure you stick around, I post as often as I can, which is usually about twice a month, so stick around for that. Moreover, check out my Patreon in the link below, where I post five minute reviews every single Tuesday, with some occasional bonus reviews you can watch even if you're not a patron. Patrons also get early access to all my content, voting rights, one of the reasons this video exists actually, the patrons voted for it, and higher tier subs even get a little thank you card posted from me. I write them myself. And an extra special thank you to Sam Jones, Carissa Fulcher, Duck, Brody Cullen, Brendan and Julia for being my highest tier patrons. You guys made this. Thank you so much. Observer introduces us to the current socio-political situation with an opening crawl of exposition, Star Wars style. The year is 2084 and there's been a pandemic of digital plague, the nanophage, an extremely contagious and completely fatal illness that we'll learn about more later. Daniel refers to it as a heavy cost for meddling with our minds and bodies. There's been a war, the Great Decimation, where both sides lost. From the ashes came Chiron, a corporation that seized power and became the fifth Polish Republic. The wealth gap grew even wider. The oligarchy corporation crushed any dissent and not even thoughts and dreams were private anymore. Chiron created a new rank of police officer, the Observer, who can access people's minds and watch their memories. Nothing to hide anymore. So there's a bunch of heavy themes dropped on us like anvils from the start of the opening crawl. Number one, technology versus biology. The nanophage is practically like a biblical plague sent by God as judgement for augmentations. Humanity has gone too far and consequently has been punished by digital disease. Number two, the game is set in a post-World War dystopia. The East levelled the West, many of the countries of the world have been obliterated, only a few remain, and Chiron swept in to sweep up the 
the level playing field. Now, able to impose as many rules and regulations as they like, and basically own humanity because there's nobody to stop them. Number three, this one corporation has so much power that they have created the Observers, dedicated to helping themselves to people's memories, with no consent required, at least at first. Even memories aren't a refuge for these people anymore. Everything belongs to the corporation. But those are just the tip of the iceberg. We start the game in the car of our main character and the vessel of our first person perspective, Daniel Lazarski, an observer currently in the field. The aesthetic of this game is one of those curiously contradictory ones. This is a world of super high technology, humans are augmented with crazy plugins and add-ons, but it's still got those dinky little radio screens. You'd think they'd have like car screens or something, but I don't know. Daniel's arm contains an implant called the Dream Eater, which is pointed out to us early in the game. This is the technology observers use to read minds by plugging them into the subject's neural implants. Every person in this world has a neural implant, not only for day-to-day -day things, but also to behave as a kind of black box that can be checked after death, although doing so without a warrant is extremely illegal, and observers are discouraged from doing it altogether due to the inherent danger. His dispatcher comments that his signal is all over the place and encourages Daniel to take his meds, which she refers to as synchrosine. During this conversation, the power goes out and Daniel's estranged son Adam begins to speak to him through the radio. Recognize me? Adam? Yes. Well, what's left of me? Adam clearly resents Daniel for something in their past, but he's reaching out now because he is so close to making a difference, to setting everyone free, but he needs Daniel's help past some trouble first. Daniel loses the signal but traces the caller ID, Leon Grabinski, a fake name. After the credits roll, they're cool by the way, Daniel spawns in Adam's apartment building. Greeted by the groundsman Janus, who I'll be trying my very best not to call Janus or even Hugh because that would be very immature, Daniel, suspicious that Adam is using an alias, gets so-called Leon. Leon's apartment number and heads in to see him, just in time to hear a woman on the phone pleading for help. Uprighting a knocked cabinet, Daniel discovers a beheaded corpse and sets up a crime scene. The head of this corpse isn't present within the room, meaning that we can't use the Dream Eater to search memories for a cause of death, so I guess we'll have to do this the old fashioned way. Here we are introduced to the game and its mechanics, most notably Daniel's three visual lenses. Beyond his standard human vision, his augmentations grant him biological and electromagnetic vision. Through these, Daniel learns that Leon died before he called Daniel. How? The only useful clue in the apartment is an email from someone with the initials HN. During this segment, a quarantine alarm sounds, letting us know that the entire apartment complex is locking down. It's the standard lockdown procedure for a nanophage outbreak, which is a terrifying prospect for the neighbours. Confused and unable to get in touch with anybody outside, Daniel goes looking for answers. Here, we're introduced to the main gameplay loop of this game, and it's a format I found myself enjoying. Since the complex is completely locked down, all the tenants are locked away in their apartments. Some rooms can be ventured into throughout the game for various reasons, as we'll discuss later, but most of the doors are basically stations you can walk up to for some very well acted exposition about the current situation, both the here and now, and the wider context of the world Observer is in. I love this method of storytelling, where everything has potential to become its own story. Leaving Adam's apartment, Danny returns to Janice and states that he needs access to the tenancy records. Janice responds that authorization is needed to access that kind of data, it's private. Private. At this, Daniel remarks, I'm a police officer, that's authorization enough. He then promptly helps himself to said information. We love a vigilante maverick cop who walks in, identifies what he needs, takes it without asking and then gets things done at the great expense of tenants' personal liberties and right to freedom, even though there's no definitive danger and he really should just be waiting for the lockdown to end. Hell yeah, solve the law on our terms, Danny. Anyway, using his newfound vigilante intel, Daniel heads up to room 104 to find this caller who goes by HN, Helena Novak. There's no Helena here, but there is a man bleeding to death on the floor. A heavily injured, super augmented man bleeding to death on the floor. He's been attacked by some beasts that we will encounter later, and now he's bleeding to death on the floor. What does one do with a dying cyborg? Take him to hospital, or do you just stick him in rice and hope for the best? His name is Amir Novak, he's Helena's husband, and since there's still no signal to the outside world whilst we're in lockdown, Daniel decides that it's time to do some dream eating. Dream eating is a concept used a few times in this game and tends to involve a fairly linear route to follow. The purpose is more to tell a very visual story, heavy with physicalised metaphor. Oh, and there are like 
way too many jump scares. After the dream eating sequence, which shows us Amir's time in prison, his meeting and marrying Helena, and some of their subsequent marital troubles, we investigate his apartment. Combining our knowledge from dream and apartment, we learn that Amir was unable to find work. He's an ex-con and a class C citizen, and companies don't hire a man with a profile. So quickly running out of options and headed towards starvation, he and Helena turn to drug dealing, which is implied to have been at least part of the reason why Amir was imprisoned in the first place. The game takes a very distinctly unempathetic attitude towards drug addiction. The game demonstrates to us, it shows us, that people in the apartment complex take drugs because they can't get jobs and they can't leave and they don't have any money and they have no prospects and nothing they are allowed to do because they are such a low class citizen and they're miserable and they live in squalor and nothing makes them happy and social mobility is a lie and they take drugs because it's something to do and it brightens their life up a tiny bit only this ends up in a reliance that becomes an addiction but even when Amir has like a bled out on the floor Daniel still looks down and sees this modified drug huffing medical mask kind of implement. And he just snarkily goes, well, you got your last fix. I hope it was worth it. Like his attack had anything to do with the fact that he was a drug taker. As we'll go through the story, you will realize how completely irrelevant it was, how there was absolutely no link whatsoever between Amir taking drugs and Amir's death. I guess it's natural for Daniel to blame him, but the game is very nasty towards people with drug reliance and addiction. Dealing is dangerous and inconsistent work, and Helena used her slightly higher social status to take on a new job, a dangerous job, which involves stealing data from Chiron, decrypting it, and forwarding it to someone in her emails who identifies only by the letter A, or Adam, as you might have guessed. We learn that Helena is in the tattoo parlour in the main courtyard of the apartment complex, and we leave Emiya's apartment to go and find her. As we all know, animating bodies is hard and time consuming, and most of the budget clearly went on that heaving Chad Janus, so by the time we find Helena Novak, she is unsurprisingly dead on the floor in a puddle of blood. Daniel scans her and confirms that it was indeed her that was calling Adam in his apartment, and after some deliberation, uses the Dream Eater on her too. He's not allowed to use the Dream Eater on dead people without a warrant, mainly because sustained use of the Dream Eater on dead bodies causes extreme instability in observers. It's got this really cool, like, gnarly name, I think it's called, like, necro-linking or something metal like that, but with the lockdown, he's free from the watchful eyes of the outside network. He is able to jailbreak his device in like three seconds and goes to town on her cooling brain. Again, our cop stops at nothing to get his clues, even if it means violating the consent of a corpse. Our Daniel is a sensitive man, but he is for sure not our good guy. Daniel observes, haha, that Helen infiltrated Chiron under Adam's guidance to steal data for his cause in exchange for some lovely money that she can use to, you know, live. Her dream sequence mostly shows mindless, monotonous office environments. There's also a lot of snake imagery, but we'll cover that later. This is also the first time in the game we can actually die. Trolling monsters are introduced, these big angry dudes with the mangled bodies and drills for arms, and what I particularly love about them is that they'll check under the desks you're hiding under. This is the first proper time in the game that a linked subject's dream sequence starts to become confused with Daniel's own memory. We see young Adam, dressed to the nines, who nervously asks if mum is going to be okay. Daniel clearly doesn't want to make any promises. While exploring her mind, we learn that Helena Novak has an external storage drive installed that she used to steal her data from Chiron. Amir is devastated that she did this without consulting him. Her dream sequences also contain a baby, except its head is a TV screen. I have no idea whether this is a reference to something real or if it's a metaphor. I'm sure someone will know, so if you do, please tell me. We hear Adam talking to Helena. He is specifically keeping her in the dark about the data she's handling. When she asks what could possibly be worth the risk, he answers, the future. Helena starts to become paranoid. We see a segment where she's running through a cornfield towards a desk, which I feel is a metaphor about her feelings of being followed, not to be taken literally. She gets home to find Amir dead, ripped to shreds by a creature, and she runs away. She's killed in the tattoo parlor in a jump scare that only worked for me sometimes. Basically, you run towards a doorway, but your path is blocked, so the game anticipates that you will turn 180 degrees back on yourself and try something else, at which point you will be face to face with the creature who should promptly scare the shit out of you. However, my first go around, I took a few little steps back whilst looking around and the jump scare noise triggered and then the scene changed, so I did miss out on what was quite possibly a dog botherer of a jump. Taking the key code from Helena's dream sequence, Daniel goes below the tattoo parlor to find a chop shop used to perform some kind of surgery, likely the surgery Helena received for her black market augmentation. 
conditions. The power cuts out just as the creature who has been on the rampage appears on the stairs above, causing the basement door to lock with Daniel safely inside. He rips up a grate on the floor and ventures even deeper under the parlour, because we have to go further down into the earth in order to escape. I wonder which poem we will see references to down here. Anyway, there are actually rooms down here, homes with horrible little wooden doors all stuck in the mud and damp. All of the residents down here are insane, whether they were insane before they arrived or the conditions drove them off the deep end is anyone's guess. Most of the side quests find their conclusions here, but again we'll talk about them later. Once Daniel finds his way out, he is corrected by Janice to the apartment of Jack Carnes, owner of the tattoo parlour. Despite the external appearance of Jack's home, he lives in luxury, or does he? Without plugging in, we have suddenly been dropped into Jack's dream sequence. Here we learn that his money is earned through producing, harvesting and selling fake organs, and, and through making and implanting black market augmentations. So you could say he's the jack of all trades. Anyway, we see Jack crucified on a big machine, or twisted wires everywhere. Then Daniel comes to, finding himself in Jack's real apartment in front of Jack's actual corpse. He doesn't remember when he plugged into Jack, and he's worried that he's losing it. Jack's actual apartment is far less luxury, but it's still quite nice, you know, he's got some lovely art. Finding the creature's blood splattered on the floor of Jack's apartment, Daniel notices a trail left by the retreating creature, and he's able to follow it. He follows the blood through the apartment complex, and the halls start to bleed and ooze around him, the walls made of beating flesh. Having now observed the memories of two dead people, Daniel is crumbling surprisingly quickly. Daniel reaches a door that he opens with the code 2069. Nice. But it's obviously a year, and from what I can gather, it's the year that Daniel's wife died. So who set this? As Daniel starts to slip further into hallucinations, the reality around him begins to melt. He's pursued more and more by the thing from Helena's dream sequence. He'll knock on a door and talk to a neighbour, turn around, and when he turns back, the door will be gone. It will be a corridor instead. Daniel will randomly be outdoors, then inside again. His eyes will show him one thing, and you'll have to use bio or EM vision to actually map out the room, feeling your way around. Daniel climbs right up into the rafters of the building, upon finding and opening a hatch without even giving the room a sweep. Dumbass. Daniel is ambushed from behind by the monster, who then immediately falls onto some machinery, electrocuting himself and dying. Time for a dream sequence, I suppose, but on purpose this time. Hooking himself up to the monster, Victor, as we find out, Daniel helps himself to the memories of the dead. Victor's mum loved him, but his dad hated and feared him. He grew up feeling isolated and alone, he loved the wolf from Red Riding Hood, and when a paternal voice began to reach out to him and help him grow, he finally had the father figure he'd always wanted. Too bad it manipulated him into murdering people, Adam, Helena, and Amir Novak, and Jack Carnes, which is also how my daddy issues manifested. Victor, and by proxy Daniel, is led by a shiny white deer through all these memories until, after a sequence in which we see all his victims killed, Victor kills the white deer, beheads it, and takes the head away. The deer is Adam, of course. Get it guys, it's a metaphor. After disconnecting from Victor, Daniel needs to find a way to restore the power, because every game needs a sequence where you need to restore power, and worms his way further into Victor's lair. This is where he finally finds Adam's disembodied head, the one missing from the first apartment. As soon as Adam is unearthed, Daniel hears his voice speaking to him. He tells Daniel not to connect to the head, Adam is still alive elsewhere. Instead, go to Sanctuary. Sanctuary, as we find it, is a weird old church full of VR capsules. Stepping into one such capsule puts you in a VR spa, which is very Lotus Eater machine of you observer, cheeky. Daniel finds he has an active subscription here, or at least one made in his name, and his capsule is ready. He steps in. When the VR activates, he is in a strange dark world full of glowing trees covered in wiring and cords. One such tree has a television implanted, and on this television is Adam. He rushes Daniel, saying, we don't have much time. What you found wasn't me. I need your help. Sense of urgency. Excellent social engineering technique there, Adam. You've really been putting to work that LinkedIn learning course you took on rhetorical devices. Adam tells Daniel that after being terminated from Chiron, he hid in the stacks. Eventually, he found people willing to help him with his major project. Adam finally tells us about the plan, all the work he's been doing with Helena and Jack. He's been figuring out a way to transfer people into the digital realm. Imagine if everything you could be transferred to the digital realm beyond sickness and death. He explains that when the splicer, Victor, came for him, he had to get out and improvise and quickly whisked himself into the digital world. Adam explains that Chiron has been pursuing him with a virus since then, a hunter-killer algorithm, whatever that means. And no, not the hunter-seeker from Dune, a completely new and unique concept that Bloober invented. Presumably, this is the monster that has been chasing us during the dream sequences. Adam continues, if I could bust out of the internal network of this building, I could escape. He releases Daniel from VR with the command that he needs to get into the adjoining high-rise, a place previously used to quarantine nanophage victims, and manually override the lockdown so that Adam can escape. Daniel obediently climbs up through the church, and after pressing some piano keys and a sequence woefully Resident Evil-esque, opens a passage into a 
super high-tech lab. Here, he finds that many people who had been forcefully quarantined and left here to die by Chiron had never been infected in the first place. Working through this impossibly large building, patrolled by monsters, Daniel finds himself squirrelling behind machinery, the walls around him slowly becoming absorbed by clumps of throbbing flesh. He blacks out, waking up in a moving hospital gurney, hearing the voice of his wife. Daniel's wife developed cancer, and she decided not to undergo augmentations that would improve her health. Daniel respected her wishes despite Adam's grief, and she died a year later. However, when Daniel got into a nasty accident and needed augmentations to survive, he accepted them. And I mean accepted them in the sense that he was operated on whilst drifting out of consciousness after the accident on the brink of death. Despite trying to say, don't, the doctors overruled him and operated on him regardless. Like some kind of husband stitch, I suppose. Adam not only considered this a hypocrisy, believing his dad to be a coward, but also felt like Daniel had killed his mother in some way by allowing her to die on her own terms and not interjecting to stop her when she refused augmentations. I mean, come on, Adam, but whatever. There's also another short sequence during which Daniel faces the monster, realising it is his own psyche, a manifestation of how Adam sees him, and suddenly Daniel wakes up somewhere new. He's in the classic Matrix-style expanse, all green and floaty, and here's Adam. Well, his head. It takes a long time to walk over to Adam, and he's creepy as fuck. He's very eerie. There's a point where his face opens up as well, and I swear it messed me up so badly. He talks funny. His mouth doesn't open or close, but rather the components that make it up just flutter around his jawline to give an impression of transition. Adam tells Daniel that he needs a host as a place to hide or the virus will find him. He reminds Daniel that observers' minds are isolated from the grid and states that two minds can merge. He also comments that Daniel's sanity is hanging by a thread after plugging into so many deceased memories and that melding minds can help restore him. He offers Daniel two choices, accept Adam and merge minds or reject, and he can't leave until he's made his decision. So, there are two endings to this story and neither of them are nice. If you accept Adam, you merge minds. Daniel regains consciousness in the VR pod at the salon, realising he'd never left it. All of that weird stuff in the adjoining high-rise never happened. Adam was hacking him the whole time, and now he has Daniel's body. Daniel watches helplessly as Adam walks out into the world, forever a prisoner within his own head. If you reject Adam, he takes Daniel's body anyway. Instead, he implants Daniel's mind into the mind of Rudy, the maintenance drone. Daniel uses Rudy to take over Yanis's body and then attacks Adam. When the police arrive to see an observer being clubbed to death by the janitor, they shoot and kill Janis, and Daniel by proxy. Nighty night, Daniel. Yeah, so if you were a bit confused by Daniel suddenly being faced by a massive disembodied head, you are not alone. I was confused. I imagine this story would be quite confusing if you played it all in one go without stopping, and really taking the time to consider where the story is going. Anyway, Adam and Adam's AI aren't the same people. Not at all. They look the same, sure, but even the AI doesn't confuse itself. It sees itself as different from Adam. And just like Adam hates his father, the AI hates his creator in turn. He uses Adam's voice, name, and likeness to gain Daniel's trust and cooperation, but you best believe the AI hates him. Adam's AI has a full sense of self. It considers itself sentient, and I suppose it is in this universe. It doesn't seem to have any of the limitations that we'd normally attribute to AI. It's entirely self-aware and free-thinking, and AI Adam looks to its creator, who deletes unwanted versions of his fellow AI for the sake of removing redundancy, whilst also making space for humans to copy themselves into the digital world, and it sees hypocrisy. The AI sees a man that wants to colonise its space, enter it, kill whatever it deems redundant, and replace it with scans of human beings, individuals that have their own world. Why do they want his? It's the AI that manipulates Victor from the shadows? sending him to murder Helena, Jack, and Adam. And Amir is just unfortunate collateral, bless him. Notice, however, that we never actually ever see what Adam is working on. It's the AI that tells us what Adam's plan supposedly is, so that may not have been it at all. He could just as well be lying to gain Daniel's trust and make him feel less suspicious about the mind merge. Remember, Daniel's like, 50. He probably falls for every spear phishing email he gets. Think of all the Nigerian print scams he's fallen on. Think of all the enlarge your penis ads he's probably clicked on. So when Daniel received that call way back at the beginning of the game, Adam was long dead. In this scene, the AI was calling him to lure him in because it needs a host. When he investigates Adam's room and the lockdown is triggered, it's the AI keeping him from escaping. Adam is never seen nor heard from throughout the entire game. He is dead and decapitated before the game even begins. Every single time we think we are hearing from him in any capacity, it is the AI. The only actual correspondence we see from Adam are his emails to other characters. Even before the game began, 
Daniel was locked into the oncoming choice of death or mental imprisonment. The second Adam's voice came over the radio, the Observer started down a path he could not change. My appreciation of Observer really started to ramp up when the game started to open itself up for exploration. It's a weird one, like the game is very linear and its story can be completed in only a couple of hours, but it has reams of side quests and completely missable experiences. If you wanted to, you could spend a few days licking this game clean and still come up missing something. Almost every single door at the complex can be knocked on and someone will usually be there to speak to you. Some of these, or other random encounters, trigger side quests. Many start in the main apartment complex, but end in the basement below the tattoo parlour, so they don't see a conclusion until you're well past the halfway point of the game. However, some quests are isolated, ranging from a few lines of text with minor payoff, all the way to sending the player into entirely new places to explore. Most of them are extremely dark and miserable and terribly, beautifully sci-fi dystopian. Now, before I continue, if you feel even slightly interested in experiencing this game firsthand, skip the oncoming section on side quests and world building. Like, I have spoiled the entire story for you, but there are still some things in this game that you can enjoy firsthand if you want to. Even if you're not sure yet and you're like, ah, oh, I, might, I might pick it up in a sale, just leave this upcoming section for now, just move on. A lot of the twists and turns of this game are best discovered organically, and I really enjoyed the side quests. I would like you to have the same experience that I did, and covering them organically. However, if you've made your peace, let's get on with it. Most of the world building is done just by knocking on doors. This means you can miss the bulk of what this game's narrative has to offer by ignoring the doors and walking directly at the objective every single time. Without further ado, I will tell you about five of my favourite side quests. Number one, Church of the Immaculate Birth. One of the smallest encounters that I absolutely adored, which I always use as an example when explaining the game to others, is the run-in with the Church of the Immaculates. You knock on one of the doors to hear a very well-spoken child run up to the door and address you. His equally well-spoken dad sends him on his way in Greece you. He introduces himself as Thaddeus Karski, a name so deliberately chosen and said that I was convinced he was a reference to someone. All I found was Jan Karski, a man known as someone who tried to stop the Holocaust or something, and Thaddeus Kriska Karski, who is just some war dude. I even emailed the Bloober team to ask them about their naming conventions. I was so convinced this name had been chosen specifically. My friend Shekel helped me write the email in Polish too, just to be extra polite. I never got a reply. Thaddeus is cagey. He looks down on Daniel for using augmentation but Daniel looks down on him in return for not using them. We're all clean of corruption, Thaddeus says snootily, and Daniel responds equally snootily, no mods of any kind is quite a statement these days, like Thad's a petulant teenager who decided to go get a stretcher earring. The quest basically exists to pose the question, is augmentation worth losing what makes you human? Thaddeus comments, is having a neural connection to the web worth losing your humanity? A web of wires worth a corrupted soul? I know our lives will be shorter and less comfortable, but it's the life we're willing to live if it means we can be our god-given selves the world would be a better place if more people realised that this is a choice. Interesting technology bad topic, I guess Bloober couldn't resist the opportunity, but that's not why I like this quest. These people have a polite but mostly unproductive conversation about the presence of suspicious activity in the building, and then Daniel goes on his way. After this original conversation, every time you walk past the family's room, you hear this horrible creepy noise, like a deep growling, gurgling sound, this weird monster voice. At first, I had no idea where it was coming from and just assumed it was ambient sound that always played at that moment, but one day I realised their door was ajar. The day I tried to open their door and it slammed in my face with a jump scare intense enough to splinter my bones was the day I think I fell in love with this game. Number two, the organ farm. While exploring the complex, you might come across room 205. You'll hear at first it has a shutter on it that's broken badly, which makes a horrible screeching noise as it rises and lowers itself automatically, unable to fully close. Crouching under the door, you can enter the room and what you find is hardly subtle. The walls are covered in big strips of skin, the fridge is full of organs, the bath is full of blood. Are they cannibals or an organ harvester? And if so, where are the bodies of the people they're stealing all these hearts from? Because sure, you can take a kidney and leave a person relatively unharmed, but a heart? The discovery is very jarring in a hotel full of dark quiet. It's an immediate shock, but there's nothing you can do in that moment. Only take the obvious key code with you on your way out and go on wondering what on earth you're supposed to make of all this. The answer doesn't come until much later 
later either in the depths of the basement. Upon finding a door with a key code, you input the number and find the organ farm. It looks like a huge mass of squirming flesh at first, until you realise there's a mouth the noises are coming from. It's a pig. A massive pig, genetically modified to be crammed full of organs that don't belong in it, living in a horrible half-life locked away in a dingy little basement. The pig has a VR headset on, which sounds funny to say, but with a tube down its throat, morphine constantly pumped into its veins, and a VR system keeping it in unconscious suspension, it thinks it's living a happy life on some fields, except with the lockdown the power is gone and now it's in agony. Do you keep it alive in the fields by resetting the system? Do you let it live a life it doesn't know is false for the sake of the harvested organs being used to save lives? Or do you kill it, put it out of its misery and lock off this valuable source of replacement organs for sick people forever? Number 3. Pieta and Paulina The story of Pieta and Paulina is a very eerie one. You arrive at a door to find a little girl speaking to you through the intercom. Her name is Paulina. She's very odd, her voice changes between her own voice and a much deeper, more mature voice. On inspection of the adjacent apartment, we find a woman tied up in a chair with goggles and all sorts of cords plugged into her. This is Pieta. Notes in Pieta's apartment refer to an asset in room 113, Paulina, the little girl. Paulina is described as having childhood disintegrative disorder, or Heller's syndrome, and cannot be helped through cures or augmentation. She needs constant care for the rest of her life, allegedly. When we use the Dream Eater to enter Pieta's brain, we find that she and Pieta share a mind. From notes in Pieta's apartment, we learn that she has some kind of disorder that is causing her to lose motor function or something, it's implied that she will die soon, I can't quite remember. Although we don't know how the arrangement began, we can assume that Pieta hooked herself up to this machine and entered Paulina's mind without consent. Pieta implores to us that since she has occupied Paulina's mind, Paulina's Heller's syndrome has improved. Paulina reassures us that, although Pieta's initial arrival was scary, she loves having Pieta in her head, keeping her company. Pieta continues, complaining that if the connection is severed, Pieta will die and Paulina will slip into a coma. You can choose to sever or restore that connection. On paper, this is a complicated choice regardless of outcome, but I think there is so much more to this. Firstly, why would her Heller's syndrome improve from having a second person in her head? There's no known cure for Heller's syndrome. And why would the absence of Pieta cause Paulina to slip into a coma? Secondly, if you choose to restore the connection, putting Pieta back into Paulina's head, you can go to Paulina's apartment to find it empty. She's gone. But, and I believe it's only in the original version of the game that you can actually enter Paulina's apartment. I think it's locked in system redux. A glance around the apartment through electromagnetic vision will find a toy with high mental activity. The toy, Mr. Scooter, is an easter egg from Layers of Fear, which could explain that mental activity, but I think it's far too much of a coincidence that Scooter has been found in this room in particular. Did Pieta's consciousness get put into the toy, or did Pieta shove Paulina out of her own body, stuffing Paulina's consciousness into the toy so that she can keep the body for herself? But that's not all. If you have a look at Pieta's notes, you can find her talking about selling doves, except she describes a nine-year-old as growing too old for a man's tastes, and that he prefers softer hens. The pigeon market on Pieta's computer is for sure not about pigeons. So what's her interest in Paulina? Number four, the cry for help. At some point during your time in the apartment complex, you'll intercept a distress signal. Going to the location of the distress signal is no help. Whoever was here is gone now. The room is some kind of grubby little sex den. They've spruced the place up enough to have a pretty neon framed poster of pinup girls and a nice full poster bed, but the walls are streaked with grime and it's not a place I'd piss in. Never mind offer guacky. Looks like you get a UTI just from sitting on the edge of the bed. The computer in here features a web page for a sexy lady called Jade. Gisabella, 10 out of 10 porn star name, and a few emails. In one email, one man writes that a guy wants to order two and they need to be ready inside and out, and that they are stashed in the basement. Except, the email reports, the lock on the basement keeps jamming and the code keeps needing to be reset and he can't quite figure out why. On investigation of said basement later in the game, you find the source of the jam and the distress calls. Sex dolls. Not yet fully made, halfway through production, skeletal sex dolls hang from racks around the room. At first, they just stick at you eerily. After an uncomfortable exchange on the command line of the PC, they briefly come to life, but they can't sustain themselves, so they collapse under their own weight and they are dead again. They've been calling for help this whole time. Knowing what we know about Adam and his AI, and the occasional humanity of other more simple AI we run into across the game, the assumptions we can make about the sentience of these poor damned creatures is, well, it's chilling, and Daniel just leaves them there. Number 5. Finally, the guy that wanted to fuck the building. My fifth example of a fantastic side quest involved the guy that was 
horny for the building. If you're playing the System Redux version specifically, you will find little shrines dedicated to someone splattered all around the building. Visit them all, then head to the room you're directed to, which turns out to be a big empty studio apartment. On the walls are rough blueprint style layouts of the building covered in semen. Yeah, some radio is playing the sounds of a woman moaning on repeat, but whoever was here just spreading his nut all over the walls is gone now. As we learn, he's gone down into the depths of the basement. You find him down here, entangled in the wires and the pipes under the building, crushed to death, probably rock hard. He died throbbing. You can do the whole neural connection with him if you want. There's a whole dream sequence wrapped away in his head where he basically thinks he's getting seduced by the building until he gets thirsty enough to crawl down inside it and die. Now, that's dedication. I think I appreciate the side quests and storytelling of this game so much because they're all about telling new stories and subverting old tropes. Every side quest in this felt like a surprise to me, with a fresh narrative twist. I never knew where they were going to go with it. Some of them were silly and weirdly whimsical, some of them were dark and very miserable, all of them were intriguing. And what's so difficult about this game is simply how little available there is for it online. You can't google shit about it, even the fan wiki is bare bones. Not only are a series of parallel stories told wonderfully through the media of objective-based side quests and eerie door-to-door -door conversations, but this is a game with very thick, well-crafted atmosphere. I've heard this game described as cyberpunk and, like, in some ways I can see it, what with the augmentations and the neon lights and stuff, and I think there is such a fine line between cyberpunk and sci-fi dystopia. I'd say this game is sci-fi dystopia with maybe, like, a sprinkle of cyberpunk motifs. The setting of this game is, without a doubt, technologically heavy. As we learn over the course of the game, every biological product, plant and animal in this game is artificial. This is a world of lab-grown meat and fake foliage. Books made with real paper are considered to be antiques. The pig found during the organ farm side quest is identified by Daniel Scanner as being endangered. There are five collectible roses in Observer, one of which can be scanned. Upon scanning, Daniel will breathily comment the real deal, as his scanner notifies him that it is a critical endangered species. The world you're in is dark and miserable. Despite the game starting at 10am, there's no light outside, it's as dark as nighttime, and rain is pouring down. The walls of the building you enter are paved with a sickly, almost holographic fluorescent panelling. It's far too bright, like the eyesore brightness of a gym changing room. Underneath that layer, as we see when the power stutters, is a horrible ratty little industrial building. The walls and floor are made of concrete and grating and exposed piping and wiring. The floors are covered in rubbish and mess and dirt and grime, grotty little stairwells, cowering corners, everything has the visual impression of being knocked together from scrap. It's not the kind of place anyone would feel comfortable, much less want to live in. Observer is dark and quiet and looks like it would smell cold and damp, musty, like there's no airflow but it's never dry, it would reek of mould, the hallways are very tight and winding. You're always aware of how little you can actually see of what's around you, either obscured by darkness, the architecture, or as the building curves. It's good, it's creepy. Combined with the ambient noise, like footsteps, rats rustling in the walls, the distant hum of like undisclosed machinery, drops of water, distant voices shouting, arguing. The space that you're in throughout this game is crafted so well. Despite like the fluorescent lighting on the walls, you never feel like you're in a safe or comfortable place. No matter how many times you walk the halls, you never feel comfortable in them, you never feel like you know them. This is especially compounded by the fact that we are in an apartment complex made of identical floors with identical corridors and identical looking doors. Sure, some of the floors are slightly different from the ones above and below, but because of the way this game is laid out, you'll often find yourself getting lost. But Observer only adds to that oppressive atmosphere with all the doorway intercom conversations. Every neighbour is an individual with their own freakiness. One guy feels super lonely when the internet goes down, and he asks Daniel to chat with him for a while. One guy repossesses augmentations when people can't keep up the payments, and alludes to removing them from the bodies of his fleeing victims by force while they're conscious. One man remarks how excited he is to be moving up to B-class citizenship. He'll finally be able to get his children out of here, somewhere new. I've been working my way up. I even filed for a status upgrade. Once that goes through, we'll be moving to a B-class district in no time. Yeah, good luck with that. Daniel smirks at the sound of this, bitterly responding, good luck with that. Everything we hear from the people behind the doors adds another layer of depth to the sheer oppression of the world we're in. The systems that relegate people to A, B and C classes, and how impossible it is to traverse between them. The system of debt that sees people have their bodies significantly augmented just to be able to have one of the most basic jobs in society. As we find out from the Church of Immaculate Birth, 
you cannot get a job if you do not have augmentations in this world. But then these augmentations can be rendered from your body if you don't keep good on the payments. Like a fake lung is some kind of Ford Fiesta. The isolation of the people stuck in these apartments, drip fed internet, like morphine and having it revoked on a whim. The fact that like VR systems are more common than showers. It's really interesting and it paints this really rich picture. I don't know what kind of picture you paint. What I'm saying is every character is worth stopping to speak to. In fact, it is through our odyssey of discovery in this apartment complex that we learn a good deal about the wider world and the socio-economic system that these people are just trapped under. They literally cannot leave. There's been a nuclear war. Class C citizens can't even afford the luxury of escaping. A system that does not see them worthy enough to exist. So you can watch them sit and make do or die trying. Our best model for this is Janus. He's the janitor of the complex, but if you check his computer you'll see he served in the war. If you probe him on the topic you'll find he was horrendously disfigured after a plasma attack on his convoy. Emails on his computer show that he's not even eligible for veteran pension because he's not working a class B job, despite being relegated to class C because of the physical straits he found himself in after his service. There are automated emails as well, which is very cold. On the next tab on the computer we see the almost comical lengths that the Republic's propaganda goes to in order to boost support for the war machine. The great decimation that levelled the planet is known in this article as the greatest conflict of our times, a baptism of fire, from the ashes of which was built the Great Republic. If it wasn't for the corporate government, one soldier commented, we would not have made it this long. Thanks to Chiron, I can fulfil my role. Spoken like a true patriot, the article comments. Some of the ways Bloober does this involves the classic technology bad takes we see occupying newspaper comic strips and your aunt's Christmas newsletter. Bloober honours strangers to lameness and Unfortunately, one of their biggest boomerisms in this game that depicts many possibilities of human ingenuity is that technology bad. And yeah, in the cases of these augmentations and these dystopic environments, okay, yeah, technology can be pretty bad. But as an example, there's a guy in the basement below the tattoo parlour who we hear screaming for help. When you make your way to his door to ask him if he needs anything, he shouts out to you in a panic, there was a tube down my throat and I'm stuck in some kind of helmet. Daniel laughingly and knowingly goes, ah yes, the Morpheus VR series. As the conversation continues we realise that this man has been so ingrained in VR that he's been living in it for years. He doesn't even recognise reality anymore. Moreover, Daniel's reaction confirms to us that this is a common enough occurrence with Morpheus VR for him to understand it straight away. Like yeah, Bloober, as a video game company, let's make fun of the poor guy living in the loose metaphor for actual hell for using VR to escape his miserable lockdown reality where he's too low class to even have a job. Let's make him a punchline. That being said, when they stop the weird preaching at Paul people, Bloober do make it work. Observer wants us to be uncomfortable with the world it has constructed, to find it disgusting and to be upset with what humanity has become. So they have three methods of making you feel this way the environment, the NPC interactions, and the actions of the player character. Throughout the story, Daniel repeatedly breaks the law with no hesitation, ignoring things like post-mortem consent, bodily autonomy, and helping himself to memories he both legally and morally has no recourse to take just because he feels a personal stake with what's going on here. He helps himself to Yanis's body in the rejection ending, and ends up getting it killed straight away. Not to mention the moral choices you as the player can make in side quests that reflect completely upon Daniel, like at the organ farm for example. The ends justify the means forms the core of Daniel's Machiavellian philosophy. Daniel and his behaviour are as much of a reflection of the society he lives in as the propaganda we see and the system of oppression we constantly ignore. The more you examine him, the more you see he's not a good person, he's just our perspective. Daniel is a lesser evil, and in the Great Republic that makes him look like a saint. Two versions of Observer were made, Observer and Observer System Redux. I've played through Redux three times, twice on the PlayStation 4 version and once on the PlayStation 5 version, and I've watched a playthrough of the original Observer just to see what the differences were, and I have to say I'm not quite sure why System Redux happened at all. Honestly I didn't check anywhere so the answer might be in plain sight, because it's like it's kind of a remake, except there are two years between each instalment and it's exactly the same. 
All it did on my end was reshuffle the locations of all the quests and collectibles, all the guides are written for Observer, and the only guide I found that was only used for Redux was in Polish, so still required a good deal of effort to pass. I'm especially curious as to why the collectibles were reshuffled, being that they were often moved just a room away. The changes seemed arbitrary, but whatever, it doesn't really matter. As with all things Bluebird, I was initially fairly sceptical about the mechanics of this game. You have your basic walking and interaction controls, but Observer also includes the three lenses that Daniel can see through. He has his standard vision, human vision, albeit with occasional UI additions. He has bio vision, which allows him to see the presence of biological matter. He has electromagnetic vision, which allows him to see circuitry and tech, even through thin walls. My scepticism came from the fact that this vision system initially seemed to me just a way to waste time. You walk through the room once with your basic vision looking here and there, then you walk through it again with bio vision, and then again with electromagnetic vision. Initially, it seemed tedious, a way to lengthen the game threefold whilst actually adding any little, but after a while I found I didn't mind it. The main vision you'll ever really need when doing quests and solving mysteries is EM vision. So I would do my quick glance around the standard vision and if I didn't see anything of use immediately I would switch to electromagnetic and that would typically do the trick. It was rare that biological vision was needed. It is useful in some quests when you're peeking at biological matter but mostly it's used for optional things, flavour text, collectibles etc. Beyond that it's a fairly cool gimmick and adds a thorough layer of world building to the game. Most items can be picked up and scanned which adds a lot of minor details to even the most basic rooms. Also, if you're a smaller development team, I suppose this is a good way to add depth to the gameplay without producing some sort of complex system of combat or stealth. But one thing that absolutely fell flat on its arse in a desperate attempt to add some depth to the game was the implementation of Synchrozine. Synchrozine is silly. Synchrozine is a pill that Daniel frequently has to take, the one referenced in the opening conversation of the game. Using Dream Eaters to peer into the brains of the living and the dead has various negative effects on observers, even when used in the long term. This is because the implant causes instability in the link between their brains and their augmentations. Without proper treatment and the administration of Synchrotine, many observers eventually snap and go on a murder spree. There's also implications that going without it can bring on the nanophage, but in practice it seems to mostly cause hallucinations, delirium and aggression. Yeah, Bluebus simply cannot resist some kind of psychological mental health theme in their stories. They love alienating their audience with tone-deaf observations about depression, assault and suicide, but in Observer they somehow find it within themselves to resist. Sure, there are some parallels to be made between observers, instability, synchrosine and the real life, but they're vague, and mechanically they're far enough removed from our world that it's not some sweeping smug generalisation. It's a detail of the setting, it's a challenge that the protagonist faces, it's a known risk he opts into as part of his job, and unlike with the medium and the Blair Witch, they're not presuming to solve any real world issues either. Well done Bluebe, the bar really is subterranean. We see the effects of synchrosine deficiency occasionally when Daniel gets stressed. Most most notably when he encounters Adam's decapitated body. On our end we just get a bit of a blurry screen and some artefacting, and to be honest, despite how cool it does look, I had to turn it off so fast. It's all well and good that we have this visual depiction of some in-game lore, but man it's really hard on the eyes, it really bothered me. Even when Daniel is perfectly medicated it still interferes with his vision quite badly, so I turned it off in the options, thank god they let you do that. They actually do have a very solid accessibility setup in Observer. As you play Observer, you'll occasionally get notified that you are becoming unstable and you need to administer Synchrozine tablets now. It's weird because it creates a very false sense of urgency and it gets you moving very quickly through the world in a bit of a panic, you know, looking for your next tablets if you're out. But Synchrozine is so abundant that you are never in a situation where you don't have any if you've been like picking it up as you go. It is everywhere, usually in multiples, like it's crazy how frequent this is. And what's more is that if you aren't aware and you haven't picked up pills, this constant pinging in your ear that something bad is about to happen gets you moving so quickly through the world that you panic and you ignore the really interesting things about this game. The Steam community pages actually show a few cases of people who were so anxious because of what was going on, you know these on-screen warnings they thought they were gonna get a game over, that they ended up rushing through the story like missing side quests, collectibles, optional dialogue, even just like basic environmental information. It's a shame to have built such a good strong story and such a rich and interesting world and then like just cart your players through it at a hundred miles an hour. It's really weirdly contradictory like do you want me to rush through to the end of this game Bluber? Terrified of my instability and the threat I could become at the drop of a hat or do you want me to sit and smell the synthetic roses? 
On my first playthrough, I fastidiously administered Synchrozine when needed, but I couldn't be asked to do it on later playthroughs and I didn't touch it at all, since I love a speedrun, and only took it in the scene at the start when you're forced to take it to continue. There are no consequences whatsoever for not taking Synchrozine regularly, aside from the aforementioned visual artifacts, which you can turn off. A few forum posters assume that you get a secret ending whereby the AI couldn't merge with you because you're too unstable, but that's not the case. So yeah, a hollow mechanic that gives a false sense of urgency in a game that is better explored slowly. Not ideal. But really, there are so few games where I've ever just bothered to slow down and experience everything the game has to offer. Not because games aren't worth your time or they don't have a lot of hidden secrets, it's just because I'm not often really that fussed on story, I prefer gameplay. I'll enjoy games a lot and have no idea what's going on. Like, I'm just, I'm just content to do whatever it is the game wants me to do. I don't need to know. And I feel like I have to be very interested in a game to even bother making an effort learning about what's going on in the game. And yeah, that is stupid as fuck, I know, because how do I know a game's interesting if I don't bother to figure out whether or not it's interesting myself? But beyond allowing you to pick up and scan items in the environment for the sake of adding minor details to any setting without needing to introduce a proper inventory system, one of Observer's greatest strengths is its dialogue and characterization. The only fully animated modelled character in the game is Janice, unless we count the weird floating AI Adam head, I guess, but as mentioned before, the peepholes are so key here in creating a truly eerie dark atmosphere that hangs over the complex, plus the constant sensation of being watched. Just because you can't see them doesn't mean they can't see you. I also came to really appreciate the dream eater sequences. Often immediate, dreams are easy ways of inserting exposition into a story without derailing it, since dream scenes do not need to flow naturally with their adjoining scenes. Sometimes these techniques are used so cheaply, like completely disjointed from the media, because there's simply no other way the writers feel like they can wedge in the exposition that's needed. Like, it's often very lazy to have a dream sequence in a game. Conversely, I feel like Observer uses these sequences to its advantage. Not only does the method of dream walking suit the literal mechanics of the game, and literally the story of the game, serving as the core of Daniel's abilities, but it offers us genuine lived back stories for each character that we wouldn't logically find out about otherwise and not in a way where the context of the story is just said to us like there's still a significant amount of reading between the lines that you have to do sure you know we might read in some notes or some emails that Helena was paranoid that Chiron was coming after her but only in her dream sequences do we see physical manifestations of how that paranoia felt and understand her panic intimately especially since every character except Daniel and Janice are dead it allows us to experience their stories fully without needing to like fully model and animate the characters which saves time money and resources without needing to be a cheap cop out that like an email or an item description might be or being some like random law inserted in to spoken dialogue, like a neighbour saying it when a neighbour might not reasonably know that fact. We also get to experience the fears and goals and dreams of the main characters as well. Dream sequences allow for physical changes to take place around you, which are often accompanied by jump scares, which I do kind of hate, but that's probably just them doing their jobs, but they also give the game an opportunity to have more action set pieces, stealth and chase alike. The game's flow fluctuates between low and high action, and consequently these dream sequences are often big peaks in the game's quality. That being said, I did get very sick of the jump scares in this game. The audio mixing is set so that the jump scares are very loud, even when your audio is low, and sometimes they're aggressive in their volume. There's one portion of the game where you're walking through a forest and every single time you pass the same point, you'll hear a metallic screech that will blow your headphones out with its volume. You're just being rude now, Observer. Grow up. So we've picked apart the on-paper stuff that I really enjoy about Observer. The quests, the twists, the mechanics, the gameplay. And these are a really solid basis to justify even experiencing the game. But there was another dimension to Observer that absolutely stole me, my gosh. The allegory, the illusions, the metaphor. Yes, my children, I'm about to get very lame, because now that we've isolated all the cool bits you can't ignore, we're going to dig really deep into the cool bits you are totally within your rights to have missed. In fact, there's a lot I probably would have missed. One thing I felt about Observer was that it was such a cauldron of ideas and inspiration that there was no way I could have noticed everything. If you've played the game yourself and you noticed something I didn't touch on here, please share it in the comments. We're all nerds on this channel and I'm sure people will appreciate the attention to detail. Anyway, without further ado, let's dig into all this literary schmeat. 
Observer is quite a colourful, almost living experience, despite ironically how dark it is as well as the short time you spend there, but to coin the prose of some nonce male author, I think this soft, wet, dripping, gaping atmosphere combined with these perky little peepholes and all the characterization and all the flavour text and all the dialogue combined to make a game that seems to take tons of inspiration from a variety of sources. I've mentioned in passing that this game features quite a few direct references to the Bible, and you Bible stands will already have picked up so much of that, but there is a huge breadth of literary references that they're almost impossible to ignore. Some are overt, but some are so subtle that they're probably just me projecting things onto the major themes of the game. Like, for instance, 1984. 1984 is easy to spot as an inspiration for this game, from the setting to the concept of Thought Police, which is likely what the observers themselves are based on as members of the police force, but the design team have never confirmed this, so this is all speculation, allegedly. In 1984, the book, not the year, obviously, the government exerts complete control over its people. They are able to arrest their citizens for thoughts they aren't even conscious of, so yes, this is, in my opinion, where Chiron found its initial roots, and we see Chiron's complete control manifested over and over again in Observer. Yep, that's right, the Thought Police isn't just some boomer Facebook outcry whenever your uncle gets temporarily banned for posting statuses about Muslims, it's a real thing, from a book that your uncle thinks we're living in. They're clearly the seedling of most similar ideas, such as Dream Eaters and Observers, but links to 1984 don't stop there. Most obviously it's a book in Adam's room and the code to his safe, so you need to see the book just to be able to open the safe, unless you guess it, which I suppose you could do, cementing that this novel is front and centre to your experience. Not only that, however, the apartment complex and all the dream sequences are full of eyes on the walls, especially displayed on large monitors that seem to serve no purpose beyond having things blink at you, and many of the peepholes through which you communicate with the neighbours will just contain single eyes staring back, so the Big Brother imagery is everywhere. We also see links to the achingly long named I Have No Mouth and I'm a Scream novel, penned by the illustrious Harlan Ellison. The novel focuses on a global AI that develops sentience, then immediately and violently rebels against its human creators. AI Adam isn't the first AI that Adam has created, try saying that five times fast. As we learn, there were a line of other AIs that were created, tested and deemed wrong or inadequate. These were all deleted, which to the AI we meet was tantamount to murder. Seeing his fellow AI killed so thoughtlessly filled the surviving AI with murderous rage and serves as its motivation for killing everyone involved in its creation. Humans see AI as soulless entities, so our AI sees that right back and acts accordingly. In the body modification section of the Oxford Handbook of Science Fiction by Ross Farnell, Ross discusses Shelley's depiction of Victor Frankenstein's spine-chilling transgression, his affront against the human soul, direly punished by his own creation. I mean, the splicer we encounter, the colloquial term for individuals who splice their body parts with mechanical animal equivalents to more closely resemble certain animals, is literally called Victor, and Victor is a curious one. Observer gives us so little about him as an individual, but from his dream sequence we can understand that he felt very different from the other children he grew up around. There's an immediate rejection and isolation we encounter when walking out as Victor into a courtyard full of children with monitors for faces. Conversely to the concept of unconditional love, Victor was indeed enough of an affront against the human soul that even his own father rejected him long before he had ever committed any acts of evil. His neighbours hated him too, even at a glance we have the distinct impression that this kid was fucking eerie. Our monster, however, is a little bit more subtle. Ross Farnell continues, saying, The monsters of cyberpunk are already loose on the streets. Quite likely we are them. The monster would have been copyrighted through the new genetics laws, and manufactured worldwide in many thousands. Soon, the monsters would have lousy night jobs mopping up at fast food restaurants. It's Janice. Yes, the act of modification itself has become so mundane that it is now just part of the landscape. It's an expected attribute, appropriated and commodified, that is required to perform the most basic jobs in society. After being bodied, literally, by a plasma mine, Janus, his name mimicking the Roman two-faced god Janus, is heavily operated on, preserving his life at the cost of his motor skills and even his memory. As evidenced by emails we can find on his computer, Janus's body graft has given him the memories of the corpse's spare parts are taken from. The corpse was the father of a man called Mike. We know this because, with his newly transplanted memories, Janus is now trying to get in contact with Mike. Janus possesses the memories of himself and the fallen soldier, 
two lifetimes full of memory in his head, a chimera of two men, a two-faced god. From Thaddeus Karski, we learn that non-augmented folk can't even get work, but from Janus, we see that augmentation is only the beginning of someday being able to thrive. And even more tenuous, we have links to the picture of Dorian Gray, specifically with the Church of the Immaculates, and most specifically in their hatred of change and desire for purity. The basic tenet of the Church of the Pure is their desire to avoid augmentation. It's even a sentiment spoken by Daniel. When his wife is facing the choice of augmentation or premature death by brain tumour, Daniel explains to Adam, if she had augmentations, she wouldn't be your mum anymore. We see in the final cutscene a rose that is interspersed with images of a neuron, a brain cell, implying that she has stayed the rose. She has remained natural and died young, rather than giving into the temptation of living a full and happy life at the expense of her personhood. Whereas Dorian Gray, who is a hedonist, desires to stay pure, young and beautiful forever. He achieves this via a portrait of himself in the attic that essentially collects his sins, becoming older and uglier, even as Dorian remains unchanged. As we discussed in the side quests and world building segment of this video, the strange sounds coming from the apartment inhabited by members of the Church of the Pure could, could, be an implied being that the family uses as their portrait, whatever form that might come in, so they gain the gifts provided by augmentation while staying true to their desire for purity. These themes line up very well. Both Dorian and the church want to retain youth and purity, and do unethical things in order to maintain that illusion. There's also a possibility of Adam being a member of the Church of the Pure, or wanting to be a member. He already has a cortex augmentation that we can plug into later in the game, but he could have had that implanted at birth or early in life without his consent. Because he does have a hatred of enhancements and it's implied that he never got any more. And Adam literally becomes the embodiment for the most corrupt augmentation possible, the AI. In fact, this hatred of the impure spans the entire culture of the world this game is based in. Yeah, you know, I did say tenuous. The evidence is circumstantial at best and could probably be disproven with like little to no effort, but I do really like this thing anyway. In the picture of Dorian Gray, when Dorian begins to come to the realisation that his decisions have led to his life falling apart, he begins to visit opium dens regularly. This is generally regarded to be symbolic of his need to be in an environment that is equivalent to his mental instability. A parallel could be drawn between Dorian's need and that of the apartment building, which is foul and trashy, in which the family themselves live. Another link between the apartment building and Dorian Gray is that of the holographic covering across all the building's walls and ceilings. Most of the central parts of the apartment complex complex is covered in holograms that do a mediocre job of covering the holes in the walls and various signs of disrepair, in the same way that Dorian's beautiful exterior covers up his internal nature, which is ugly and evil. Dorian's ugly centre is contained in the portrait. Perhaps the apartment complex's ugly centre is contained in the apartment of the pure. Either way, there's a lot to chew on on this game, and most of it's probably not right. Despite myself attending a Catholic primary school and a Church of England secondary school, I remember looking at the story of Observer and thinking, okay, so here's Adam, and uh, okay, she's definitely Eve, even though her name is Helena, and uh, there's a snake, and there's an apple, but I feel like there's so much more biblical stuff that I'm missing. I know the Bible basics, but I remained very hesitant to make this video, knowing that I absolutely would not do any biblical interpretations justice. So I waited, and thank god my friend Carissa gave the game a little look through on my behalf, and I don't want to get ahead of myself, but it turns out that Daniel is the name of a man from the Bible. When I told Carissa that I thought Daniel was a David Bowie reference, because his surname was similar to one of Bowie's final songs, Lazarus, I heard their head hit the desk from halfway around the world, and then when they were helping me they had to figure out how to the Bible, which is apparently kind of a nightmare. This section is dedicated to Carissa for explaining to me that the Nebuchadnezzar is not just the name of the ship from The Matrix. Get it? Because they're awake from the dream? Anyway, let's, let's get into the biblical discussion. Daniel is Daniel, obviously. I say obviously because it was not obvious to me. I have no idea who Rutger Hauer is. He's Daniel's voice actor and an acting icon, apparently. And I thought that the character was based on the late David Bowie because it's an old white man with brown hair. Turns out he looks almost identical to Hauer. In fact, he was even modelled after him. And then I thought maybe it's based on the biblical Lazarus because of his surname, Lazarski. But no, yeah, it's Daniel Daniel, as in like Bible Daniel. And the game actually makes that really clear. One of the inhabitants under the tattoo parlour even asks, is that short for Daniel? Like the one in the Bible? Bible, which is very on the nose. This woman even introduces herself as Maria, 
which is quite similar to Mary, also from the Bible, I guess. Sort of. Not quite. But how? Daniel is equipped with an implant that is colloquially referred to as the Dream Eater. This implant enables him to connect to and explore other people's minds and memories, which is surreal, often a dreamlike experience, full of metaphors with a myriad of different interpretations. Which takes us to the story of actual Bible Daniel, most specifically that of his translation of a dream he had by King Nebuchadnezzar. So basically, Neb had a dream, and he wanted people to translate the meaning of his dream for him, but he also wouldn't tell them anything about the dream. He didn't want to give them any clues whatsoever. He was basically like, look, stop buying time, try and ask for details, you morons. Tell me what my dream meant, or fuck off. And people are starting to panic a bit, because this king is obviously completely unstable, and Daniel steps in, and he prays for a bit, and then he tells them the answer. To the king, Daniel describes this great image whose brightness was excellent stood before thee and the form thereof was terrible this image's head was of fine gold his breast and his arms of silver his belly and his thighs of brass he was a chicken his legs of iron his feet part of iron and part of clay thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay and break them into pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together, and the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them, and the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth." Daniel's interpretation is essentially that the stone cut out without hands is representative of the gospel of Christianity, and it will roll forth, destroying the great empires of the world, and clearing the way for the second coming of Christ. I would argue that a solid observer parallel could be that of Chiron, a stone rolling forth that destroys everything in its path, all the beauty and purity of humanity, and becomes the centre of everyone's life, a mountain that fills the whole earth. But again, there are definitely a ton of interpretations you could use. The Great Decimation, for one, albeit the Great Decimation was more a symptom of the stone rolling forth than a cause when you think about it. The thing about Nebuchadnezzar's dream is that, like observer itself, it is extremely thematically vague due to its nature as heavily symbolic. This allows for pretty much anyone to put whatever they want onto it as metaphor, with almost no room for argument, because who are you to tell me what the stone means? But a lot of you will be thinking, Daniel's story isn't only about the dream. He, later in life, gets thrown to the lions, trapped in a lion's den, and there are no lions in this story, except his son Adam, who now goes by the fake name Leon. The second Adam gets the call from the AI, pretending to be Adam, his fate is sealed. It is too late. He walks right into Leon's apartment, the lion's den, and the place locks down tight. He never returns from this alive. Albeit, God saves Daniel in the Bible rendition. I guess AI Adam didn't get the memo. Adam's symbolism is as obvious as you can get. He is clearly an analogue for Adam, the first man according to the Bible, and the relationship between Adam and his father is a parallel of God and Biblical Adam, when the fall of mankind occurred and Bible Adam was cast out of the Garden of Eden for eating a little bit of fruit that his wife had basically twisted his arm into eating. Adam and his father have an extremely tense relationship due to Adam's hatred of cybernetic body enhancement, his opinion of his father as a hypocrite for receiving such mods and his rather extreme politics. Thematically, an easy parallel is Bible Adam's disobedience of God in partaking of the fruit from the Tree of Life, thus leading to his and Eve's being cast out of the paradisical, paradisiacal, 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 thus leading to his and Eve's being cast out of the paradisiacal, Garden of Eden. However, in the Bible, Eve is seen as the corrupting influence. But our Eve, Helena Novak, is anything but. In fact, it is Adam who corrupts Helena. Although, a small aside, in terms of corruption, do you need to be corrupt to rebel against Chiron? Is it really corruption if you are escaping an evil system through your own means, which in this metaphor would make Chiron God instead of Daniel, or would it? The Fifth Republic might be like the Garden of Eden, which has a whole host of things to unpack. I guess it depends on your interpretation. I don't know. I warned you that the allegories kind of wrap up and overlap really weird. Anyway, yes, the character of Helena is a clear-cut Eve figure within the game. As Daniel works to find Adam, or figure out what happened to him, the trail leads him to Helena, who is dead by the time Daniel links with her mind in order to gather information. During the dream sequence, there is all sorts of apple and snake symbolism. Daniel follows a giant cable snake in order to delve further into the dream. After talking to the creepy kid, there's another cable snake, the apple on the operating room table, which turns into a snake when it's picked up. We see similar snakes in Jack's room later, where Helena went for her augmentations. Upon 
possible interpretation of all this could be that Helena is corrupt in the same way that Adam is. Technology would be the serpentine devil in the metaphor, which leads Helena, and Daniel by extension, away from her pure intentions to something more sinister. In the same way that Adam and Eve fell from the Garden of Eden, Adam and Helena fall to the negative consequences of their own good intentions when the plan to save humanity backfires and they are murdered in cold blood by a resentful AI. The choice that Bible Adam makes to eat the fruit and leave the garden is a choice between the status quo, God in the garden, staying under Chiron in the Fifth Republic, and massive change, Adam becoming something new by changing the workings of mortality and therefore destroying his ecosystem of Eden and God, implanting human consciousness into a digital world and escaping the confines of the mortal world. Adam could also be viewed as making that choice between accepting the world staying as it is or rebelling against corporate governance. He chooses the latter, which leads him down the path that eventually creates his own opposing force, the AI that kills him. Beyond the references to heaven and the Garden of Eden, we also see torrents of references to hell, specifically the tattoo parlour, through which Daniel must descend to the lowest floors, the bottom circle, to be able to escape from. Inside the tattoo parlour is a tape recorder that recites some of Inferno. Yes, that Inferno. Canto 1 specifically. It recites, Midway upon the journey of our life, I found myself within a forest dark, for the straightforward pathway had been lost. The voice on the tape then says, It is the seventh day of my forcefully imposed penance, and I can already attest without any doubt that this place is in fact hell. These people are dead to the world, their bodies shuffle around in tiny apartments, but their minds are long gone. So yeah, you know, it's very on the nose. A moment later we find another passage. Consider ye the seed from which ye sprang. Ye were not made to love like unto brutes, but for pursuit of virtue and knowledge. This is another section of Inferno, during which Dante meets Ulysses, who describes how he used his gift to convince his somewhat reluctant crew to continue their adventures together. Ulysses was so persuasive that his crew was literally willing to sail to the ends of the earth with him. As he recalls his words, Ulysses recognises that his persuasiveness is a good part of actually why he is now in hell. Many of his crew died on that voyage, which is a shame. This is suggesting, in terms of like, Observer's story is that as humans we justify our own behaviour in the moment and only on reflection do we maybe see that it might not have been the best course of action. To both Daniel and Adam the ends justify the means. One voice recorder recites, Fear not the passage, for no one can take from us which has been given. And when I googled it, it offered zero results. As it turns out, it's because the in-game rendition is a mistranslation. The actual line is from Canto 8, lines 104 to 105. Fear not, because our passage, none can take from us it by such is given. The meaning of the original line is essentially, don't be scared of how we are travelling, because it is given to us by God, and so no one can hurt us. Jack's desperate to usher in a new era of mankind. He has a notable lack of empathy that others comment on. He does not just want to improve improve their quality of life, but to improve mankind as a whole. The mannequin of Helena in Jack's apartment is holding a red orb, an apple. He has a portrait of the Garden of Eden in his apartment. He is working directly with Adam and is treated most like a partner compared to Helena, who is referred to as a mule. So Adam makes the software, Jack makes the augments. Is Jack the serpent or is he something else? So, there you have it. I have been threatening this video for a long, long time, and I do mean this. Observer is an all-round good game by a company known for churning out dog shit. It is a diamond in the rough, and as you can see from my other videos, I am really cynical about the studio. I wouldn't normally have good things to say about their games, so I want you to know that I do mean this, honestly. Still, if you are interested in hearing me talk about all the things that Bloober do shitly, try my other videos on the other games. The Medium video and Bloober's Blair Witch video. Like, we pull no punches because, I have to be honest, they are utterly irredeemably trash. The Blair Witch slightly less so, but it is still kind of trash. Otherwise, please like the video and subscribe if you enjoyed it. I try to post at least twice per month and there's plenty of other upcoming videos for you to sink your teeth into, so that'll be good. A lovely bit of video. Anyway, have an awesome week guys and I'll see you in the next one.